very much and hello again. So in my previous job, before I came to work for Cap Fleet, I was a police officer up in Grand Prairie. I did 34 years of service there before I was recruited by Cap Fleet to come work for them, which is how I wound up here today. Now in my previous job, whenever I was moderating, it was usually between a couple of parties that were in some sort of dispute. So <laughs> this will be a little bit different format for me. And so uh, with regard to, to being a moderator, I'm kind of a rookie at, the, at it. So bear with me on that. Um, so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to pose a, a few a series of questions to our panel, and then if uh, once they've finished answering the questions, we'll kind of keep it as a as a uh, with a good flow. And if y'all have questions that come up um, during the course of, of of the answers that they give, then then I'll uh, call on you to uh, uh, pose your question, and then we'll move on to the the next one. And then we'll, of course we'll have the question and answer session at the end as well. But I wanted to give you the opportunity to pose a question while it's fresh on your mind, if that were the case. So, how many people here today are currently in business? With a show of hands. All right, and how many people here today are wanting to get into business but have not quite done it yet and they're looking for some, for some groundwork? Very good. All right, so about 75% of you, it looks like, are currently in business, and then about another 20 to 25% appear to be uh, interested in starting a business. So I think that this panel is going to be uh, a good uh, platform for, for everybody that's interested. So uh, the first question this morning um, that I'm going to pose to uh, Jim is, uh, what should a small business owner do before sitting down with a lender? Okay. Thank you. You know, you, of course, you want to be prepared because you only have one chance to make a good impression. So when you go in to see a lender, they want to know how much money do you need? How are you going to spend it? How much money do you have to invest in this business? But what happens if something goes wrong? And so the worst thing you can do is, is have a partner and y'all go out that night before you go visit the bank and you work out the details of what you need for your business on the back of a napkin and you go in and you look at that napkin and try to convince a banker that uh, they need to loan you money. Of course, you want to be prepared, and banks are wanting to, to provide you money for good opportunities, but they don't know what a good opportunity is unless you tell them, and that's through a well-prepared business plan and financial projections. Can you pay back the money that they loan you out of the cash flow of the business? What does your credit score look like? Do you know what your credit score is before you go talk to a bank? How much money do you have to invest in the business? Because banks aren't going to loan you 100% of what you need, but you need to be prepared. And so whenever you go in to talk to a business, whether it's a startup business or an existing business, getting money is about reducing risk. And if you can reduce the risk and show the bank that this is a good investment for the bank, because the only money that the bank's gonna make off of you is whatever interest rate they get, and the funds that you have going through their bank. They're not in business with you, so they're not in business to go to the risk factors like you would with an equity investor. They want to make sure that you have a good chance of success. So you have to be prepared and get rid of the risk. If you're starting, a, let's say, a, a very risky business is starting a new restaurant, which Rusty mentioned before, those are really tough because there's such a high failure rate. So if you're a new business starting out, what can you do to reduce the risk? If you don't have any experience in the restaurant business, maybe you should take a look at a franchise, or maybe you should hire someone that's been in that restaurant business for a long period of time to show the bank that you have thought through this process and you know that it's a difficult process, but you're eliminating some of the risk that's involved in that. As you get prepared to start your business, hopefully you've been working on your credit score. You know, a credit score is nothing more than a report card of what you've done in the past uh, in paying your bills. Does it indicate that if the bank loans you money, will you pay them back? So if your credit score is weak, then what can you do before you go ask for money to build that up? Um, so it's just things like that to be prepared, make a good impression, know how much money you need, know where you're going to spend it, and know how much money that you have available to be able to invest in that as well. 
Nancy, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I had a couple of additions. Um, on a business plan, that freaks a lot of people out. You know, it's like a college dissertation. But, you know, I personally think in bullet points. So your business plan could be a PowerPoint with bullet points. It can have maps showing your competition. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, 20 pages of, of narrative. So keep, keep the business plan simple because when it goes to a credit officer, they're not gonna read through that. And if they, if they can't figure out how you're gonna pay it back in let's say 10 pages or less, they're, you know, that's not a good thing for, for, for the business. Yeah, i give an example of that. Uh, several years ago, I had a, a lady that had been working in, in starting a business for a number of period of time. And I guess every time that she thought about something, she put it in her business plan. She presented this thing to me. It was 104 pages long. <laughs> and, and I told her, I said, I'll go through it, but I want you to know I'm the only person in Brazos County that will ever read this business plan. And so I, I agree wholeheartedly. Most people are afraid to write a business plan. And some advisors uh, suggest that you write a business plan and do financials. I always work with clients and we work on financials first so we can see if it's feasible or not. And then we go back and write the business plan to tell the story. But the business plan tells the story and you highlight what you have your strengths in. So if your strengths is in past history in the restaurant business, then that's what you want to highlight. If it's for a particular type of, of food or something that you are you know is very popular, that's what you want to highlight. But that's where you use your influence on not only the lender that you're talking to, but that lender also has to go to a, a, a loan committee. And really the business plan serves as a sales tool to the other lenders that are there so they can thumb through that and look at that and see what your business is. So I agree wholeheartedly, it doesn't need to be too long. Have a real good executive summary because what most bankers will do will read the executive summary, flip over to the financials and see if it works. And then if it makes sense, they'll go back and look through at some of the other stuff in between. And the projections, which are part of a business plan, is where the SBDC can help you because those projections have to be quantified versus qualified. For example, we're going to go back to that diner. How many tables does it have? Um, how many chairs at each table? How many times do they turn a table? What's the average ticket price for uh, average meal? So those, that's quantifying those projections. So you do need to have you do need to drill down into that. And once again, the SBDC can really help you with that. Thank you. All right, any questions of our panel so far? Yes, sir. I just want to highlight that this month, December, is National Right of Business Plan. And <laughs> on our website, I'm sorry, Office of the Governor, on the gov.texas.gov forward slash business, it's in the bottom left of that slide. Uh, we have a, a newly launched <laughs> Uh, page specifically about addressing how to write a business plan. On there also is information of how to get in contact with the SBDC Small Business Development Center, such as Jen, uh, which can assist you in that production of your business plan. Also, I have to throw it out that many of the SBDC services are at no cost to you, the small business. That would be all of our services. All of their services are at no cost. To you. So definitely utilize the SBDCs and they can help you creating that executive summary. But National Right of Business Plan, you can see we have a one hour webinar also on that link that you can review as well. Just wanted to throw that out there. All right, thank you very much. And for those of you that may not have heard, he was referring to the, uh, the link on the slide over there, the uh, texas.gov slash business, which has a lot of uh, materials that can assist you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I'm Jen Morris. I'm with the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. And also, we have some resources there too. Uh, we have partnered with, or have been partnered with uh, the Brazos Valley Affordable Housing Corporation. They have one and a half, because a half doesn't mean anything, but they, um, one of our uh, people there used to be a very, very successful financial planner. And he kind of retired from that because he was very successful. And so he is now working for that organization. And he 
you can go in, whether you're trying to buy a house or start a business or expand your business, and he will actually sit down with you and help you formulate that plan. Because it could be like foreign, you know, lingo jingle out there. And he's excellent. I mean, I've, I've sent many people there. The other part of also uh, part of our programs, because we're here as economic development department, is that we also have a revolving loan fund. So what that is to do is that if a bank is able to fund some portion of it, and yet not the whole portion, or maybe the terms are way, you know, depending on the market, whatever, you can come in and we can, you can do an application and we can see if we're gonna be able to loan out money to you to expand or start up your business. So those are two kind of uh, hidden secrets uh, the council is right over on 29th Street um, in uh, Bryan. So again, um, Jay Mador is the financial uh, planner or financial uh, planner that we have over there. I've actually worked with him on some plans, and he is just remarkable. So it helps you to get through those steps of how do you even begin and what kind of information you need, um, whether you're trying to buy, you know, a business. And also for many people trying to buy a house to support from the businesses that they may want to start up. So two, two great resources if you don't know about it. Say the name again. So the Brett, uh, Jay Mador, and there's another guy, I think it's Bill, uh, he's not there as much. Uh, they're through the Brazos Valley Affordable. He's actually the Financial Fitness Center. Oh, Financial Fitness Center. Yeah, but it's um, through the Brazos Valley Affordable Housing Corporation. You can call that number and ask for Jay, he's remarkable. He's so knowledgeable and he's very like easy going. Like he says things in the way you can understand them. And then the um, our revolving fund is going through, it's through our department. Yeah, it's going through the, our um, economic development. So you can call up uh, the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. And what's your extension here? Uh, 2036. 2036. So our purpose is to support seven counties um, to help them with whatever they need for their business growth in that way. That's what we're here for. We're a government entity, and that's what we're here uh, to do. So we this is written. All right, like she said, a lot of great resources here in the room, and after this session, you'll have an opportunity to network with some of the other folks in here today, and if you have any, any need any additional details from anybody that's here today, then be sure to reach out to them. Who else has a question for the panel off of this first question that we were talking about? Yes, ma'am. What if you have no collateral? Your business is literally like I'll take that, okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, the majority of small businesses utilize the SBA loan program, which is um, the loans are from banks, but the SBA, as long as the business meets all the criteria, the eligibility, they provide a 75% guarantee. Now, so you're, so the bank, in case of default, then the SBA would, would pay 75% of the debt back to the bank. And this, this allows, that's the majority of small businesses, that's where they get their financing. And um, Texas is a wonderful state, we all know that, and we have the Homestead Act. So in every other state in the United States, you have to uh, use your house as additional collateral. But in Texas, you're, that house is yours, so that's a good thing. Thank you, Governor Abbott, but um, and the forebears. Um, so you can get a loan. What's more important, if you don't have collateral, is what's your experience level, and as uh, Jim mentioned, what's your uh, credit score. So not having collateral is not a game stopper at all. Thank you. Anybody I will else? say it's very, very difficult to move yeah. forward uh, without any kind of equity injection. Um, so if you'd come to us and say, I don't have any cash to be able to put in, we'd say, what else do you have? Can you go get a home equity loan to be able to come up with some money to be able to, to leverage that money to be able to, to start a business or grow a business? So um, I'm not aware of any programs that are out there that will loan you a hundred percent of what you need. Now, collateral and equity are two right. different things, okay? Just equity is the cash that you bring in, and it's usually for small businesses, 20% of your total project. And then collateral is fixtures, furniture, 
equipment or a building, but but definitely you have to have equity, and you and the collateral is uh, depends on the whole loan package. And help me with this, but SBA typically doesn't care much about collateral, but banks do care. True that. <laughs> Yes. I understand that banks can get forgiveness for missing out on loans, but when you're a business that's been hit by cybersecurity incidents and things like that, wouldn't a grant be a better option than a grant to get them all paid off? Now, for cybersecurity, I know there's a whole session on that, but please get cyber security insurance, everybody. I, I mean, it's it's just it's the it's the riding of the wave is rising, and um, that may be true, um, but just please get cyber security insurance. Just small, it's it's not very expensive. Certainly, everyone would prefer having a grant rather than a loan. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know that they're they're out there and that are available. Okay, good. Sometimes you see stuff on paper that don't, doesn't actually come through, but at least it'll give you a good start. I think we have a question. Yes. Well, what we, you do is you get the... She wants to know what amount of money or what minimal amount of money that you have to have in your checking account to be able to uh, qualify for a loan. We, we look at the, you look at the whole project, fig, uh, build out, furniture, equipment, working capital, and let's say that that's 200,000. For most banks, 20% is the equity. And so then whatever that total is, you would bring in 20%. And where do you get, if you don't have the 20%, where do you get it? What well, Jim mentioned, uh, home equity. And banks will consider home equity, not just the equity in your home, but you have to get a home equity loan to inject the money. But we um, have to make sure you have a secondary source of repayment and not the proposed business. It needs to be a spouse, uh, some rental income, uh, do you have savings? Um, um, those are the things we look at. There's also another source of equity that you, a lot of you have is your 401ks. And you can get a loan from a 401k. Well, you don't get a loan. You, you, it's a self-directed where you change your 401k to where you get to choose what business you invest in versus Exxon and Google, and then you can invest in your own business. Now, there are some fees associated with that to, to administer it, and you do need to get uh, a CPA firm to, um, to administer it, and there are some expenses, but that is a source of, of equity for, for some of you that may not have the cash. Um, so there we go. Yes, that would be included. And there's another little trick in that. If you buy a piece of land for $100,000, and as long as you hold on to that land for at least two years, the SBA will allow you to use the appreciated value as your equity. Let's say that two years later that land is worth 200000 then there's 100000 equity that you have. Now, your project will go up because... You put 200 instead of 100 in the project cost, but that is another source of equity. True, but we do, okay, let's say that you're gonna buy, you, you need land, you're gonna build a building on it to run your business. We'll finance the land, the uh, architect fees, the uh, the actual building, fixtures, any equipment, and working capital, all in one loan. Yeah, so it's everything that you need to be able to start the business, open your doors, and have your first customer. Not only the needs to start the business, 
but you also need to have enough working capital in there to be able to support the business and so you start getting money in. So if you're in the service business, let's say you're in the oil and gas business, uh, oil and gas companies are great, especially when oil prices are close to $100, uh, but now they're low, And but oil companies take 60 to 90 days to pay. So that means you have to go through three months worth of all the cost and expenses that you have before you receive money. So that's a huge amount of, of working capital. And your question was, how much money did you, do you need to have to be able to start your business equity injection? It really depends on how you're using the money. Is it a startup? Is it an existing business? Um, so with SBA, one of the good things about an SBA loan is they typically have less equity uh, injection uh, requirements. Uh, if you're gonna go with a traditional bank loan, then sometimes 20 to 40% equity injection is required. So it just depends on what you're doing, where you are, what you're, how you're gonna use the money. Because a lot of startup businesses don't have any collateral to go with it. It's leasehold improvements, it's inventory, things like that. So naturally, that's going to, to typically require a larger equity injection. But uh, Nancy will probably talk a little bit later on the difference between 7A and 504 loans. But if you're doing land and building, then you know possibly a 504 loan would be, would be good for you. If you're going out in the country to buy land to put it on, you've got to make sure if it's got an ag exemption, for an example, somebody's got to pay those rollback taxes. Uh, if it's you got a house on the property, you've got to separate it from your home because the, the bank can't take uh, your your homestead as part of the collateral. All right. Any other questions? All right, Nancy, you had uh, mentioned the SBDC. Um, what other uh, organizations can help a small business owner get get ready to apply for that first loan? Well, um, the SBDC is your number one um, source. In Nancy, won't you let me take that one? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, really, the lenders that you go to, they have the knowledge and the expertise to help you. What they don't have is the time. SBA realizes that someone needs to help small businesses be able to get to that next step because as we've all been told that small businesses are the backbone of our economy, but if they can't get funding, they can't be the backbone. So there are several SBA resource partners that are there and their sole purpose is to help small businesses create economic impact. We are the largest SBA resource partner. We have over a thousand SBD centers just like mine scattered throughout the country, but there's also other resource partners such as SCORE, SCORE are primarily in large cities, but they are typically retired executives. They do the same things that we do, uh, which is consulting for, for free. Uh, they offer training as well. Uh, women's resource centers have the same services as we do, but there's only a handful of those scattered throughout the country. And then uh, veteran resource centers, there's a few of those scattered throughout the country, and I think Texas has too. All of us have the same purpose and that is to help small businesses learn, grow, and succeed. And they, we do that through training, through advising, uh, to be able to help you move forward. I've been an SBA lender for 25 years, and I've financed a lot of businesses, I, probably 50 a year, so y'all can do the math. What I always recommend when somebody comes to me, because once again, depending on the amount of time I have with each different customer, I may have a lot of time or I may have five minutes. I always recommend that the business owner form an advisory board. And on that advisory board, you would have your accountant, our bookkeeper, a CPA. You could have a, a trusted advisor, maybe somebody from your church, other small business owners. And guys, get to know your competition too. Most business owners are more than happy to help other people coming into the, to that type of business. Now you don't wanna to go to the one that you're gonna down the street, but it, of course I live in Houston, so you know there's so many areas of Houston, it's so big, it isn't an issue. But 
you know, online to hook up with somebody that can, you know, be on your advisory board. And that really helps to have that in your business plan so that the bank knows that you, you know, just didn't think this up, but that you have, you've thought it out and gotten advice from experts. And I'll also add that when we have clients that come in with poor credit scores, um, Lisa, stand up a second. Lisa is my <laughs> other consultant in our area. She's been with the organization for 30 years, and she says she's taught me everything that I know. So, uh, But we don't know much about credit repair, so we send them to the Council of Governments. And Jay is great in helping them be able to move forward. It's something you can't do overnight. So you'll be surprised at what resources are out there. Um, a lot of times we're the best kept secret out there, but if you get in the right venue, you know, part of our job is, if we don't have answers or solutions, part of our job is to try to find those answers and solutions. Yes, ma'am. We don't credit score per se, but usually over 600. Sometimes you may have a lower credit score based on a medical collection, which I think those have become, in, they're not allowed to have those on credit reports anymore. But um, if something happened and you have an explanation for it other than a repossession or default, I mean, people have lives and understand what's going on, but there is really no minimum credit score, but I would say six. 600-ish, and it's so easy to fix your credit, guys. I mean, it's, it's you can do it yourself, or you can, you know, there's lots of free, there's lots of resources out there that it will help you, because, um, you know, it used to be that credit scores, you couldn't fix it, but now the they've stepped in and regulated that a bit. And, you know, when you pull your credit score, you'll get, you'll get a score from whomever you pull it from. When you go to the bank, uh, most banks will pull a credit score on you. And even though they're maybe using the same credit agency, their numbers come out different because you can turn the dials a little bit on, on the criteria that they, want, that they look at and that's important. Um, most banks that I work with are looking at 650 or above. Um, but there's also something that, that a lot of lenders, especially the online lenders are doing um, which is a, a small business credit score. And so it considers a lot of different things that really only a rocket scientist can figure out. But it, it looks at your personal credit, it takes a look at the industry and several other scenarios to come up with a small business credit score. And if you don't, if you don't reach whatever their criteria is, then you're not in the box to be able to get a loan. So, most lenders will say that credit score is important, uh, but as Nancy said, it's how you got to that score that's probably uh, even a, a bigger issue. Are we addressing what y'all want to hear? I'm just curious. Okay, good. All right. Anybody else have any questions along some of these topics? Yes, sir. Um. Jim, just explain that. It, it's just um, business analytics and take it into the industry that you're going into as well as the your personal score. And probably geographic is, fig, uh, is figured in that too. Yeah, and so a lot of, a lot of suppliers, for an example, will report uh, your payment to Dun & Bradstreet and yeah. some other business um, accredited entities that tell you how your businesses are paying your, your bills. But almost, unless you're a multi-million corporation, uh, you're still gonna be personally liable for whatever loans that you take. Uh, so they're gonna take a hard look at your, your personal credit score as well. Right. Jack? Mr. We have a mic if you have a question that we have one can Gotcha, so if any of you in the back have a, have a question. Sorry, uh, we're not very good at repeating questions. Yeah, there's, there, there's that the, was another uh, way to stay to that, I'm sure, okay. There's a uh, microphone in the back, that, so if he can hand it to one of y'all if you have a question that you want everybody to be able to uh, to hear the question, which is a benefit to the rest of the room too. All right, so you had mentioned the, the credit scores and things like that, helping out the people that are looking to start a small business. What, uh, why should a small business consider like an SBA or a USDA loan? Um, okay, there's SBA, 
loans which are 75% guaranteed by the government. Most banks will do an SBA loan. Make sure that you get a bank that is a PLP lender, and that's called Preferred Lender Program, and that means that we can approve the SBA loans ourselves versus having to send them to the SBA to get the SBA to approve it. Now, USDA loans are for primarily for rural areas, and Houston definitely is in a rural area, so I don't see a lot of those. Now, College Station isn't considered a rural area anymore either, right. but uh, outlying areas are, and a USDA loan is usually for a much bigger project because there are a lot more costs associated with it, like you have to have a feasibility study as well as a business plan, and um, there are more fees. Um, so I'm gonna bring up a 504 loan too, and that was mentioned earlier. So a 504 loan is a loan between a bank and a community development corporation. And what that is, is let's say that you have a million dollar request, you put in, and it's a startup, you put in 20%, the bank will finance the first 50%, and then the CDC will finance the um, 30%. So, and the CDC rates are, well, I, that they're based on um, debentures, which is the open market, but usually it's a better rate than you can get at a bank. Um, but the bank, the reason why that's important is if you have a piece of land and the bank is lending 50%, well, we have a 50% loan to value, which makes every credit officer dance. So that is a very low uh, loan to value. If it doesn't have real estate, it's not, the 504 is not a good choice. 7A loans, for instance, the, the, the situation we were talking about with you with the land, if it has land and is primarily real estate, we can go 25 years. Um, a conventional loan, you may get a 15 or 20 year amortization, but every 10 years that loan will renew and it will readjust to whatever the interest rates are at the time and what, what, and if you have deteriorating credit quality, the bank may ask you to go to another bank. Um, so the other thing about an SBA loan is that, you, as we discussed in your situation, you can include the land, the building, we include a contingency fee for overruns, for equipment, uh, working capital, fixtures, all in one loan. So you have one payment. Usually a conventional loan, you will only, you'll have separate loans and they each have different terms. If you do get an SBA loan that does not have real estate and it's mostly fixtures, equipment, build out, it's on a 10-year amortization. And SBA loans are fully amortized, meaning that you're not, for that 10-year, you're paying the full P&I and at the end of 10 years, your loan is paid off or the 25 years. Um, I, I would like to add a couple things because I know we're getting short on time. I got a 10 thing. I just wanted to mention a couple things, okay. Number one, if it was easy, everybody'd be doing it. So know that starting and owning a small business is hard and we're all very sympathetic for you, but, and it, but if you can't handle the heat, it, I mean, as the diner that, um, uh, was mentioned, the stress is is high. So you have to really gauge your tolerance, your risk of um, your risk for stress. And the other thing is, if you haven't if you haven't started a business, don't quit your job. <laughs> Keep your job, and then work on your business plan. And yes, it's going to take a lot of your time, and you may think you don't have enough time. But wait till you have that business and you got a crying baby in your hand 24-7. So just, that's a good gauge if you should be able to start up a business. The other thing is keep your family involved. Don't, don't do it, don't be a lone ranger. You know, share your idea with people. You'd be surprised what everybody has to um, contribute to what your plan is. And um, the other thing is, be very clear of what your business concept is, the elevator speech. Have that down, because you never know who you're gonna meet, and you want to make sure that they know what kind of business, and that person may be able to help you. Um, and then I did talk about uh, the advisory board. 
Uh, I just think that's crucial. Even if you already have a business, having an advisory board. And I tell you, people are flattered when you ask for advice. You don't have to take it, but people are flattered when you ask them. And um, as I mentioned, get to know your competition. And um, that's all. all right. Let, can I add one other thing? So why do you want an SBA loan? Remember we talked about risk and what you're trying to do is eliminate the risk for the bank. So when you go into a loan, a lot of times clients come to us and they've read the internet and they said, I come in for a certain SBA loan, whatever that may be. What you're really needing is money. Do you care what title that comes from? What you're really looking for is money and banks are the gatekeepers. So you prepare things just like we all talked about. You present it to a lender and let that lender help you determine, are they going to go with a traditional bank loan? Are they gonna go with a 7A loan? If they need the SBA, will they use a 504? So SBA takes some of the risk out of it for the uh, bank. Uh, interest rates are pretty similar. Uh, terms and conditions are better with an SBA loan. You've got fees that you have to pay with an SBA loan. It takes much longer with an SBA loan PPP lenders can take some of that uh, length out of it. So at the end of the day, you're looking at money. But what the main benefit is with an SBA loan is you may get money with it and not get money without it. Um, as far as banks are concerned, guys, if you get a no, ask them why and ask them, what can I do different? What, what could I do that would allow me to get this loan. Because you may submit it with a 10% equity, and in, in reality, if you would put in 20%, they may be, oh yeah, we'll do it with 20%, because banks want skin in the game. Because if, they have, if you have skin in the game, you're gonna, you're gonna take care of it more than if you have nothing. Uh, grants was mentioned, and it, grants come up a lot. I actually did a loan for a woman that got a grant from a Beyonce Foundation, and she that that grant was ten percent of her equity, and the borrower had ten percent out of her own sales. I mean, out of her own uh, savings. So there are grants out there, and it just depends on the purpose, who you are, where you live, what the purpose of your business is. There are some, but. Keep in mind, banks want you to have skin in the game. Thank you, Nancy. Real quick, Jim, I just wanted you to also possibly get on working with an SBDC on finding a bank that works with your industry and how that can that can actually get you a no sometimes when you didn't even think it was. So the question is the question is what I was actually going to address is what if you get turned down? What do you do? So some banks don't do startup businesses or don't like startup businesses. Some banks don't like particular industries. You don't really know what those are. Um, and so hopefully if you go to a bank and they say, we don't like startup restaurants, you'll know what it is. But that doesn't mean that you can't go someplace else to get a loan. Money is money. So what we do at our office is if someone comes in and they uh, have a banking relationship, we'll always send them back to that bank to, to get a yes or no to start with. If they don't have a banking relationship, we work with every bank here in Bryan College Station. We work with several in Houston and several national bankers. Uh, I'll go through my Rolodex and call and say, here's the deal. This is how much money uh, equity my client has to put in. Here's the industry. Here's their personal financial statement. Um, here's the business. Are you interested or not? And within a short period of time, they'll tell me, yes, I'm interested, or I don't know. Let me take a little bit more and look at it. So I'll send them a, a business plan, financials, and some more information, contact them again. Yes, we're interested. No, we're not. If they're interested, then I'll send the client there and let them interview with them. So there are other ways to do it if you get a no, but find out for sure why that bank gave you a no, because as Nancy said, you may be able just to restructure it a little bit to get in the yes category. And please, try to meet with your banker in person. Don't, you millennials, don't just do it online because it's, once we, we you know, we're we have to judge character too and that's a big part of approving a loan, so do that. And the other thing is, 
always go to several banks, even from the get-go. I work for Frost, and it's the best bank in the world, I promise you. But I would definitely go to multiple banks because, you know, you may like working with one person versus another or the terms they offer you may be different. So always don't just go to one bank from the get-go because, like, I have my set of experience, but another banker may have a whole different one and they can give you a good, in, a different insight. All right, thank you. We have a question over here. Real quick, uh, we own several businesses, but the new venture that we're looking at starting, we have several people looking at wanting to invest with us. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. Is that something like, how do I get advice on having people invest in us? Because we have friends and acquaintances and that's a little scary to me. How do we get more information on that? You do need to get professional advice, especially if it's friends and family, all right? Right, right. <laughs> so where do I go? Do I start with a small business development center, or where yes. do I go? Yes. So, you know, partnerships or investors are kind of like marriages. Some work out, some don't. So whatever, whomever you get to invest in the business, always thinking, think about how do I get into the business? How do I get out? And there's really no set formula out there that I'm aware of saying, okay, if I come up with the idea and you give me X amount of money, you get X amount of percentage. It's all negotiable. Uh, and so maybe an attorney that's been real familiar with doing joint ventures or doing networks like that has got some ideas. Uh, there's a, a, a good uh, handout that you can get called uh, dividing the piece of the pie. So uh, it it divides business up on what they actually add value to the business to. So there's some things that you can come up with, but there's no set formulas that I'm aware of. There is one thing that if it has real estate, what you can do is have the friends and family invest, quote, in the real estate, but you maintain ownership of the operating company and the operating company leases the real estate from the real estate holding company. That is a way because you, they can invest and they're gonna get you know, the, all the tax benefits with owning real estate and taking the depreciation and all that. But then if you maintain your um, operating company, but you do need to get a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. And, and they stay out of your business if you do it that way. They invest in the real estate, you run your business. All right, well thank you all very much. It's now time for us question. to- we got one more question, can we take that? So uh, one of the first things or hoops you have to jump, I guess, is getting approved for the loan, whatever. But um, I would suppose that uh, using you guys, the SBA, getting a loan through the SBA, um, would be a better source because uh, once you get approved for the loan, then you have all these clauses, or right? Like, and one of them that kind of scares me um, as because I had I have a loan, is for example, me and my husband are partners, and if one of a one of us dies, then the the bank can call the loan. Um, and Not on a SBA loan. So too. yeah, that okay. was my question. And if you get an SBA loan, are the clauses a lot? more lenient? Um, are they standard? What, what? There, there are the lending requirements for SBA loan. The SBA has designed it to be less onerous to the business owner. For instance, you don't have to, some loans you have to have audited financial statements, which is expensive. But with SBA, you just have to have year end financials and tax returns. You don't have loan covenants. Like for instance, let's say pandemic and you had a negative of uh, cash flow, well, a bank could call it in, but when you have an SBA loan, as long as you're making that payment, they're not gonna mess with you. But in your case, I would recommend that you get term life policy and what that you can assign it to the bank. So if something happens to one of you, then the loan is paid off. And that's a really good way to manage your estate for any business owner because term life insurance is not as expensive as whole life. And that way you're leaving your family or your heirs a business that is paid for and your business is probably, that business is probably gonna have a higher chance of success with, you know, you're gonna leave a legacy more so. 
It, and we're out of time, so if there's any other questions that y'all have, we'll be around. Um, our office is located, we're normally in the Chamber of Commerce office, and as soon as they build their new building, we'll be back in, but we're in the same building as they are just downstairs, uh, so you're welcome to come by and visit with us, call, email, or just come by. We're try to answer whatever questions that you have, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to speak uh, today. Thank you. And y'all know where the, our office is, Frost Bank, right? <laughs> Okay, that's kind of a joke. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, Nancy and Jim.